Something drove all of us here, our thirst to know the Dhamma. For many people who come to the Dhamma is because of the experience of unpleasantness, unhappiness, or even downright suffering. I look at all of you, you seem like suffering a lot. <laughs> the front row one sitting without the back. <sighs> <laughs> Some of you there came because of limited parking, came at 6 o'clock. Until now, no dinner. Also suffering. Some chiapakalai cannot find a seat, also suffering. Some chiapakalai have to listen to one, two hours of lecture, also suffering. So I think we are all suffering. And therefore, we all have to find a way out of this suffering. The wise man will not continue to suffer if he is wise enough to see that he is already suffering. He should enhance his wisdom by looking further. What is the cause of this suffering? And what is the solution to suffering? And this is what the Buddha fundamentally taught. So before I go on to talk about the Buddha's message, I also like to relate to Buddha the man. Just now we heard a woman talk about Buddha the man. <laughs> so now a Malaysian man is going to comment <laughs> on the same topic. But I thank Sister Sylvia Bay for really enlightening us on many fundamental uh, misunderstandings about even the biography of our teacher. Among all the great religions in the world, Christianity, Islam, there had been or there are embellishments to the biographies, to the life stories, to the narration of the founders of this religion. But they are not as far-fetched as what Buddhists have made the Buddha to be. And all this came actually later. The Buddha's life was not the highlight of Buddhism. It only became so remarkable, so fantastic with later storytellers. And there was a classic written in Sanskrit. It is called the uh, Lalita Vistara. Lalit means story. So that itself tells you it's a great work of poetic beauty. It's written in classical and semi-classical Sanskrit, talking about the exploits of the Buddha before he was even born. He was in Tushita as the god Shantushita. And he was implored by the other gods of Tushita. I say, it's time. Human beings are suffering. But they are also wisening up from suffering. If they are suffering and not wise, then they cannot find a solution to their suffering. But they are also wisening up. It is time that you are reborn in the human world to guide beings to see the end of suffering. So that was the beginning of that beautiful work called Lalista Vistara. And later, that work became very influential that it spread backwards to other schools, even older schools of Buddhism. And even today, Theravada school of Buddhism take in all these stories and made it their own. And there were compositions later that were done in Pali language, which was the, which is still the canonical, canonical language of Theravada Buddhism. So this is a background of uh, how all these uh, embellishments became de rigueur, the standard, not de facto, not factual, but it is just the standard narration which many Buddhists are familiar with today. But if we go on, as uh, Sister Sylvia has mentioned, to look into, to examine the life of the Buddha. Take out all the seven steps 
that he did after his birth. Take out all the seven lotus buds that sprang with each step he made. Take out all the fabulous miracles which he purportedly uh, made, you will find an even more remarkable Buddha, sans embellishment and sans legend. The legendary Buddha is not as great a being as the actual Buddha. You have to understand this. If you don't understand, please read her book. <laughs> we have uh, all these Buddha images done to our highest cultural ideals. After Emperor Ashoka, Buddhism did not just remain a Gangactic or Indian religion it became an Asian religion. And in modern times, it has become a global religion. Buddhism spread from India to Central Asia. In Afghanistan, they came to a place called Gandhar. And from Gandhar, went upwards into Xinjiang, and from there to Chang'an. And from China to Korea, and from Korea to Japan, and from there to Mongolia, and everywhere today even to the West. And Buddhists, we hold the Buddha at highest ideals. He is so, so human, but at the same time so super. So we made him like a superhuman. So all the, the images we have of the Buddha is that superhuman. So in depicting the Buddha, for example, in uh, art, in paintings as well as in sculpture. We try to put in all the ideals in our mind, in our concepts, in our culture, to that image or to that sculpture. So that's why the Buddha appears so different in different cultures. If you go to China, of course we know the Buddha was from India. He, he never left India. He never went to China. But if you go to China nowadays, look at the Buddha images in China. Don't they look very Chinese? <laughs> some look very prosperous. <laughs> and some wear Tang Dynasty costumes, not the Indian costumes found in Theravada countries. And if you go to Japan, the Buddha images there look Japanese. I once gave a talk in Manchester. When I arrived at that very small, beautiful center in Manchester, in the middle of the hall, there was this altar. And then sitting on the altar was a very elegant Buddha Rupang, Buddha image. And that was a Buddha image that looked like an English. <laughs> Manchester Buddha. <laughs> Three days later, I traveled to Berlin. When I gave the talk in Berlin Vihara, I saw a German Buddha. <laughs> very stout and a very strong, very very jagged, very, very Deutsch. <laughs> but you know what? In my travels, I've never seen a Buddha image that looked like a Singaporean. <laughs> but, 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 my dear friends, I have seen some Singaporeans that look like the Buddha. You heard me right? <laughs> okay, I've not seen a Buddha image that looked like a Singaporean, but I've seen some Singaporeans that look like the Buddha. Not that I've seen the Buddha, but I have read people's description of the Buddha. It's not just his disciples' description of him. It's not just uh, his own description, how, how handsome I am and so on, but contemporaries from other religions in their scriptures, contemporaries of the Buddha, they also described the Buddha as a very 
joyful, happy looking person. He never looked gloomy. He never looked moody. They describe him as a hatta pahatta, joyful and joyous. Uda yeah. gudhaga, uh, always very serene. Panyaloma, very tranquil. And piniti uh, indriya, his senses are very restrained. Not too exuberant, but not too, not too stoic. Very lively and very natural. They describe the Buddha as someone very pleasant to look at. They describe him as apo suko, someone who is free from anxiety. They don't look anxious at all. The Buddha looked just like a normal human being, but the mind of that being was pure. Sometimes I see some Singaporeans also like that, rarely. But I did see. You can perfect your look <laughs> to look like the Buddha, as what other people have described the Buddha. Try it. Smile a bit. Lah. <laughs> Despite your suffering, smile a bit. Wow, <laughs> it's OK, don't smile like that. Don't smile like that. You look around you to a member of the audience whom you may not know. You look around now and wish that person in the depths of your heart, wish that person, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be free from suffering. Wish it with sincerity. Wish it, wish it. Do it lah. <laughs> may you be well, may you be happy, may you be free from suffering. Okay, look at me and wish the same. <laughs> may, May Brother Tan be well. Okay, quite sincere, not bad. May Brother Tan be happy. May Brother Tan be healthy. May Brother Tan be free from suffering. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That moment when you're not preoccupied with yourself, or you are not fettered by craving or attachment to something, or indulging in your memories, or indulging in your fantasies. That selfless moment that is full of compassion and kindness. That moment, you look somewhat like the Buddha. Except the Buddha had that permanent look. <laughs> Malaysians and Singaporeans have impermanent look of joyful countenance. So this is the Buddha's physical feature. He looked very human. Now to prove the point, after the Buddha's enlightenment, he gave the first teaching in Isipatana in Varanasi. And then he told the disciples, I'm going back to Uruvela. The reason being, in Uruvela, there are 1,000 ascetics living at the banks of Gaya River who were ripe in their faculties of wisdom. But they haven't got a chance to listen to the true teachings. They haven't got the truth ingrained in the mind. So he said, I will go back to Uruvela. And when he went back and talked to them, and the sutta was presented just now, one of the slides, Aditya Pariyasana, or Aditya Pariyaya Sutta, um, the other sutta, Aditya Pariyaya Sutta, a fire sermon, and all of them gained enlightenment, and they all became monks. And what happened, the Buddha led a thousand new monks. Many of them were older than the Buddha. The Buddha at that time, when he was enlightened and when he started teaching, was only 35. It's a very, very young age for a very enlightened being. But his wisdom was beyond the age. And he led this group of some senior practitioners who have been practicing ascetic practices for 30, 40 years. And some were 70 years old. So he led all of them into the city of Rajakaha, 
when the whole congregation entered Rajagaha, everyone made way and they cleared the town square. And then they made, you know, those days, they quickly get bamboo and wood and make dioceses and temporary stages like this, where the monks were invited up there to sit. So they sit in rows, one row, two rows, three rows like that. And the people gathered just like everyone here in this hall and gawking at all the new fashion because at that time, what the Buddha wore was still new, what we call today the Buddhist monk's robes, and all clean shaven, because in India, not all ascetics were shaven. Some were kept long locks of hair, matted hair. Not all ascetics looked the same. So they wondered, hmm, among all these people, who was the teacher? Who was leading whom? They, they couldn't differentiate between the Buddha and his disciples. So that is one of the occasions, one of the proofs, where the Buddha did not look like what we made him to look in Buddha images, with sharp things and aura coming from his, uh, what you call, the body, and then, uh, you know, golden skin and so on. He was handsome. He was well-born. He was still youthful. He was tall. We all know that those are the physical features, but he wasn't so outstanding. Yeah. He was pleasant to look at, but the people in Rajagaha that day couldn't distinguish which was the teacher, which was the student. So understanding the people, the minds, their doubts and perplexities, the senior teacher of his disciple, former teacher of all the other thousand monks, he stood up, he arranged his uh, upper rope on one side like this, and then he bowed to the Buddha who was seated next to him, half his age only, and he said, Satar Bhagava, Savako Hamasmin, Janai Bhagava, Nahang Janami. You must watch more Hindi movie <laughs> to understand. This is Pali language. He said, Satar Bhagava, the blessed one is the teacher. Savako Amasmin, I am his disciple. Then the people say, Oh, si ene. <laughs> Another occasion, sometime later, the Buddha arrived outside the village when it was evening. He sought shelter in a potter's shed. You know a potter? They collect soil to make into pots. Yeah? So soil, so hot day, they make a temporary shed and then they work under the shed, next to the field where they collect the soil. That is called a potter's shed. Today, you can still see many of these in India. So he sought shelter in that shed. When he arrived and entered that shed, there was already a young man, clean shaven, and then sitting there in meditation. So when he entered, the young man stirred and greeted him and said, friend. And then the young man said, friend. He said, may I take shelter also in this potter's shed? Sure, friend, you are most welcome to shelter here together for the night with me. So both of them sat down. And the Buddha, noticing this young man, he said, this is, this is remarkable. This man is in his early 20s, so youthful, so vigorous. But the way he sat, the way he smiled, the way he carried himself, and the way he carried the conversation, it was not the average person on the street. He is cultivated. He is cultured. So he asked, you know, why did you leave home? Because he was wearing the garb of a homeless person, a monk. For whose sake have you left home to become a monk? I have left home to become a monk under the discipleship of Gotama the Buddha. He said, have you met the Buddha? Would you recognize the Buddha if you had met him? He said, no, friend, I have not met the Buddha. And 
I would not recognize him even if I met him. See, where is the Buddha now? Oh, he's in the northern country in Savati. This is where I'm going towards. What did the Buddha do? What would you do if you were the Buddha? <laughs> I know what Malaysians and Singaporeans would do. It's wahalo. <laughs> Wahamasi Buddha la. Yo. That's why we are not Buddhas. <laughs> Buddha did not do that. He said, he said, never mind. I shall teach you the Dhamma, monk. Said, oh, okay. Yes, friend. Please teach me. As the Buddha was talking about the mind and the necessity of cultivating the mind, Pukusati the young monk's name was Puku Sati. He was following the teaching. Jin Chuan Sim ne? U Chuan Sim bo? Yo Chuan Sim ma? You will get the same effect leh. <laughs> he was following it internally. Many people only follow externally. They follow my hand gesture. Not follow the drift of the teaching. Not going deep into the message. Therefore, the message doesn't go deep into them. But Pukusati had samadhi. He focused. He did not allow his mind to drift away or to be distracted by externalities. He paid attention. And the more he heard, the more he understood. And finally, at the end of the sermon, he realized who this person was. He stood up, put his robes like this again. That's why I keep it like that easier. <laughs> Paid respects to the Buddha. He said, I am sorry I call you a friend. I should have recognized you as the teacher. So he bowed down low and he asked to be ordained. So this is in the Majjhima Nikaya. It shows that externally, Though the Buddha looked very proper, hen tuan zhuang, hen zhuang yan, just like our images, but it wasn't so outstanding and so alien. He didn't look like an alien. He was a human, but human par excellence. The real Buddha is not in the flesh and in the skin. If you look at the Buddha, and think that this is special because we make him special externally, then we haven't understood the Buddha. There's a monk by the name of Malungkya Buddha. He liked to look at the Buddha. Every time the Buddha gave a talk sitting, all the monks would gather near. They have to gather near because there are no sound system those days. <laughs> you can't sit all the way at the back of the hall, you can't hear a thing. They all sat as close to the Buddha as possible. And Malungkya Buddha always sat at the front row. Why? Because he was so enamored by the looks and the countenance of the Buddha. You know, the Buddha looked very different when he teaches the Dhamma. This is brightness because your, the listener's mind also brightened up and you can see that the, the teacher has that kind of effect on the students. And he always stood at the sat at the front row, and he admired the Buddha, but no Dhamma go in. <laughs> Though he respected the teacher, but he was fettered. He was attached to the looks and the countenance of the Buddha. One day the Buddha noticed him. He said, Malungkya Buddha. He said, why do you look at this body that is full of impurities? Only outside, scrub, 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 put moisturizer. <laughs> Inside, all dirty and defiled. Nothing that comes out from our body is clean. It's all rubbish wrapped up by skin. What is in this body that you look at? It's nothing attractive at all. The Buddha taught him this very important lesson. So be it for us today also. He said, Yo damang pasati, so mang pasati. Yo mamang pasati, so damang pasati. If you see the Dhamma, the teaching, then you see me. And if you look at me, 
you see the teaching. If you see the Buddha's message, then you understand this, who the Buddha really is. And if you see the Buddha, you can see he is the embodiment of his message. The Buddha was the embodiment of the virtue he taught people. The Buddha was the embodiment of mindfulness he taught people. The Buddha was the embodiment of peace that he taught people. The Buddha was the embodiment of liberation and freedom which he taught people. You look at the Buddha, you see his message. Mahatma Gandhi copied the same thing when I went to his ashram. On the way into the ashram, I saw a life-size poster of Gandhi and the words there. It happened that one day he was leaving the ashram and a Western reporter asked him, Sir, Sir, Gandhiji, Gandhiji, do you have a message for the world? And Gandhi, walking with his stick without turning back, and he said, My life is my message. That was what the Buddha meant. His life was his message. So it's very important for us Bud Buddhists. If we really want to understand Buddha, the man even, we have to understand Buddha, the message. The Buddha, at a young age, saw the purpose of life, saw the possibility of liberation in from suffering, and he struggled, he strove hard, diligently, and he attained liberation at a young age. What the Buddha realized, he called Dharma, and what he taught, he called Dharma. He himself was called by others as the Buddha. What is the meaning of Buddha? Bodhiti Satchinati Buddha. One who has understood and realized the truth, he is called Buddha. Did he realize the truth of life? Yes, he did. So he realized. A realized being is called Buddha. Da. But not only that, he has a special faculty. He was able to reach out and teach people and make people see it also. Bujahati Pajayati Buddha. One who can enlighten others also. He is the Buddha. So not only was he himself enlightened, he has the faculty to enlighten others. So he was called the Buddha by many as a form of respect. And what he taught was called Dharma. What is the meaning of this Dharma? Dharma means that which holds up, that which upholds nature. What is nature of life? The truth of life. That we call Dharma. It's a very common Indian word. Sanskrit, Pali, Hindi. Dharma. It has so many meanings. But here, it means the truth of life. Dharma. So if we want to know who the real Buddha was, we have to understand what his Dharma is. What did he realize? And what did he teach? Now, the Buddha did not teach Buddhism. The Buddha taught Dharma. We made up Buddhism. What the Buddha taught, not everyone understood properly. So we added a lot of our own interpretation. We added our own commentaries. And over the centuries, all these became accumulated as Buddhism. So today, many people, they look at Buddhism sometimes at very simplistic level as a set of rites, rituals, and beliefs. And they say there is no sophistication in this teaching. So everything is kiwa paya, kao tao, kui. Do you understand Hokkien? <laughs> Otherwise, I can switch to Pali. <laughs> 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 
Namaste or Namaskar, you see like that. So nothing. Whereas some people who are well read, who are intelligent, some professors that I know of, when they say, oh, you're Buddhist, they like to discuss. So you're Buddhist. Oh, very interesting. They like to discuss philosophically. But the Buddha, he didn't teach a philosophy, or he didn't teach a set of beliefs and backed up by rites and rituals. He taught a way for us to understand the truth and the reality of life. And that truth and reality of life is that it is unsatisfactory. Life is unsatisfactory. Uh, out of uh, respect <laughs> for the couple, I shouldn't talk about life is unsatisfactory. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it just shows you timing is unsatisfactory. <laughs> the same monk, Malunkya Putta, who admired the Buddha's looks, one day he also started to ask question. Why? Eh? He asked and asked and asked himself. Lah. He couldn't figure it out. So one day he approached the Buddha and sort of challenged the Buddha. He said, Lord, Bante, you must tell me the answers to these questions that perplex me. If you cannot answer these questions, then I'll be disappointed and dissatisfied with this monk's life. Straight away, I will stop being a monk, I'll go back. These are the things that perplex me about the universe. Is the universe eternal? Is the universe not eternal? Is the universe limitless or is it limited? These are the things that some people also question, right? He also had that kind of thoughts. And then he challenged the Buddha, if you cannot answer me to my satisfaction, then I will live this holy life. Then the Buddha told, Malunkya Buddha. He said, You want to know these things which I never taught you. And you have to understand why I did not teach the monks these things. Because they are not fundamental to the spiritual life. They are not essential to the holy life you are leading as monks. These, today, they are called metaphysical questions. We always have this life and universe and why are we born and all these kind of things. We ask these kind of questions. That's why people have to go to religion or even create a religion in order to satisfy these curiosities. But the Buddha specifically told Malunkya Putta, these are not taught to you because they are not fundamental to the holy life, to spiritual development, and to enlightenment. In your case, Malunkya Buddha, may I use a parable? So suppose a person is shot by a poison arrow, and then his family and friends saw that and get very kanjong, came to him and said, let's pull out the arrow. He said, stop, stop, don't pull out this poison arrow. I first want to know who shot me. <laughs> What's his name? Chui Chui Kawa Usyu. Which family? Stay where one? Pongo or Paseris. What kind of bow? What kind of bowstring? What kind of arrow? And what kind of poison? Semalung Kya Putta. Before all those answers, can be given to the man, he would have died by that poison. So your case is like that. We ask questions which we have no direct experience of and even no relevance to our lives. Those are speculative questions, metaphysical questions, philosophical questions. What the Buddha taught, the Dhamma, was fundamental and essential to our present lives. It is the medicine. 
the panacea for our suffering. That was what the Buddha taught. He taught us life's unsatisfactoriness, the causes of unsatisfactoriness, and how to overcome the suffering of this unsatisfactoriness. That is fundamental to your life as well as to mine. We, Malaysia, Singapore, very blessed, especially Singapore, I never see hunger. Everyone well fed. <laughs> Since arriving, I haven't stopped eating. <laughs> I only stopped eating when I started speaking. Physical suffering, we may not have much here in Singapore. Everything is convenient. This hall is air conditioned. You don't have to strain your ear at the back to listen. Yeah. But mental suffering, we have a lot. Yeah. We may not have it now because this session has been very entertaining. <laughs> but we cannot escape from suffering. Some people think to escape from suffering, we seek happiness. Happiness is not the answer to the end of suffering. You can have both. If we ask you, do you have no happiness? Surely your answer would be, well, I do have a lot of happiness. My children are doing well, They're all graduated and working. My wife is obedient. <laughs> we are all well fed. Our MRT is working again. <laughs> but that doesn't free us from suffering. We have happiness and we also have suffering. So if you think by having more and more happiness and that will cancel out our suffering, then we don't understand yet what is suffering. There was a lady who suffered in order to free herself from all this anxiety and all this keksima, she went for a holiday. And my, my, I haven't heard of such holiday. It lasted six months. <laughs> from Malaysia, she flew to Japan, from there to Hawaii, and then to California, and then to the East Coast, from there to Europe. And she got so tired of packing and unpacking on holiday, she had to have a holiday from the holiday. <laughs> she went to Dubai or Abu Dhabi, and she stayed in a penthouse, two stories, 32 floors, overlooking the Gulf. And sunset over the Gulf was magical, she said. Beyond that, the sea, and then near shore, the desert, golden. She said, as I was at the balcony of the penthouse at the 32nd floor, overlooking the Gulf and looking at everything golden hue, tears flowed down my cheeks. Not tears of happiness, tears of sadness. I was imagining her description. I said, if I were there, I have tears also of happiness. <laughs> because that penthouse, two-story penthouse, 6,000 over square feet, had three butlers working 24 hours to serve every need you have. I said, I would have tears of happiness. <laughs> that is happiness for many people, but not for her. So as soon as she reached Malaysia, she called me up and said, when can I come and see you, Brother Tan? I said, Wednesday, and she came, she, she talked, two hours she talked. And then after that, I told her, you know, this is the cause of your anxiety and your fear. He said, are you brother Tan? I should have come to see you six months ago. <laughs> Save myself from the six month holiday, wasting time and still haven't found the answer. So happiness is not the solution because you would have had solved your suffering because you have ample happiness, ample opportunities for happiness. That is not. So therefore, friends, we have to understand the cause of suffering is our craving, our attachment, and especially of our perception, our views, that we must have something, and if we don't get it, we will feel the sense of dissatisfaction. Even getting it, it doesn't last long. Happiness is like this. 
we can describe it as anichang dukkang viparinama dhamma. Happiness, even though when we experience it, is anichang, is impermanent. You get that success, that feeling of fulfillment. Wow, it lasts one hour, two hours, half a day, two days, one week, and then it slowly dissipates. Anichang. What is impermanent, yat anichang? Tang dukang, it is unsatisfactory. That doesn't provide you permanent solution to the state of life, the stress of life. That doesn't give you freedom from stress of life. Viparinama dhamma, because that is of the nature of changing. So happiness changes. So even if you gain something, you may not be very happy and for long. That reminds me of a very interesting story, this boy. I was teaching meditation in a university over a period of time. This boy was the coordinator of the meditation class. One night at about 11 plus, he called me. He said, Brother Tan, I have something that I need to tell you. You have to help me. You please promise to help me first. I said, wow, very serious problem. Maybe he wants to become a monk, want to stop study already, want to renounce and the parents object. Wow, I was racing ahead of my, my thoughts. And then he said, yeah, Brother Tan, there's this girl. <laughs> there's this girl. I said, I can't stop thinking of her. I said, it's always on my mind. You know, you have to help me, Brother Tan. He said, you know, I said, well, I teach people to let go. <laughs> By the way, in meditation class, I said, close the eyes, watch the breath. Why you open the eyes and watch her? I can't help you, Brother Tan, I can't help you. Maybe past life karma, I don't know. You must help me. I say, it's difficult. I, 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 I don't normally do this. I said, Brother Tan, you have been coming for a university. First day you came, I was the one waiting for you at the guard house, right? <laughs> Every time you want any notes, I photocopy for you, right? Everything you want, I say, yes, Brother Tan, I did it for you, right? And Brother Tan, did I ask you for any favor? <laughs> wow, this is putting me in a very hard spot. So I said, okay, okay, exception. I said, you do this. So I asked him to do this, 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 this. Wow, he was listening. I said, can you repeat that? That's okay. <laughs> Must be recording everything. And I was thinking in my meditation class, never asked me to repeat anything. <laughs> so he was writing, 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 I, I suppose. Then he said, Brighton, this one, sure work or not? Sure work or not? I said, never fail before. <laughs> Never fail because I never tried before. <laughs> so I was speaking the truth. So he did that, and they became a couple. So yeah, at least I know something worked. <laughs> that was what I called now the formula. Now after some time, he called me again, and he said, Bratan, you have to help me. I said, why? It didn't work. I thought everything worked very well. You look happy. He said, yeah, it worked. But now I want to be free from it. <laughs> I want to be free. I thought that was your dream uh, partner and everything. Yeah, yeah, she's very nice and so on, but too possessive. <laughs> Morning, have to fetch her, go for breakfast, send to class, lunch must have with her, dinner must have with her, study only with her, cannot go anywhere with friends, not even for basketball games. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> Please give me the antidote. So here you have it, friends. Something that we desire very, very much. And when we get it, we desire the opposite. This is what the Buddha taught. The cause of our suffering is this perception as the view that we need to have something in order to be happy. They need to be obedient. They need to cooperate. The world needs to be like that. Government needs to be like that. We have all these perceptions and views made up. And we delight in our views. Let's say you like someone and you look at someone and they say, oh, this feeling of asada. Asada means pleasure. I really like that person. Every time I go to class, I see that person, I feel very happy. Oh, wow, I get very excited and so on. And then after some time, 
if you don't see the person or the person don't heal you, <laughs> the person don't want to look at you, you get the pain, you get the rejection. And that is called adinawa. The danger of liking something is the disappointment from that very same thing. That our expectations and desires are not always met. So if we are free from all those desiring and not desiring, which is what the Buddha's message is about, then we become in the state of mind of nisarana, that I am not depending on all these externalities for my happiness, for my satisfaction, for my fulfillment. That I am okay. I can be free from worries, fear and anxiety. I can be free from stress now. This is called nisarana. This is called the understanding the message of the Buddha. So dear friends, tell me whether this is relevant for the present century, the 21st century. Tell me whether this will be relevant for the 22nd century. This is why the Buddha is called Bisaka, the doctor. You choose a religion, not going to the religion that scare you. You come to the doctor, you don't want the doctor that says, Wow, why you come only now? You should have come two years ago. How serious your condition? You don't know? You, you don't know? You know? This is, wow, very bad and so on. And when you hear such things from the doctor, you lose hope and you panic and you have fear. Your mind is unsettled. You are shaken. This is called a pessimistic view. This is not helpful to you, my dear friends. But neither do you want to go to a doctor and say, ah, small problem, no issue. A lot of people, 15% of Singaporeans also have this. <laughs> You're all right. We think we are okay, rosy, everything. We don't take care of ourselves. We don't pay attention. That is called optimistic. You don't want that also. But I'd rather go to a doctor that says, well, after seeing your condition, this is what you are suffering from. And this is the cause. In order to cure yourself, this is the cause of medication and cultivation you take. I want to know exactly what's wrong with me. And I want to know the right way to overcome it. This kind of doctor is a realistic doctor. And this is who the Buddha was. He is called Bisaka, the great surgeon, the good doctor. So this is always relevant in any century, including ours today. So dear friends, time is way up. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone for really paying attention. And uh, look forward to your questions to Sister Sylvia Bay. <laughs> thank you.